जय तो संस्कृत जय तो भारत माई पेपर इज कॉल्ड संस्कृत इज नॉट डैड एंड दिस इज इन रेस्पॉन्स टू पॉलक्स क्लेम दैट संस्कृत इज डैड एंड हियर आई हैव आउट लाइन ऑफ पूर्वपक्ष अंडरस्टैंडिंग एंड एक्सप्लोर पॉलक्स आर्ग्यूमेंट्स ब्रीफ समरी ऑफ इज केस स्टडीज and in response i am going to give a case study of raja raja case study why we are concerned about pollock statement because pollock is a very important person he is a top sanskrit scholar in usa he is having international acclaim he has received padma shri from president of india and more than that he is the general editor of murthy classical literary library of india and thus he is very influential because he is going to publish all these books uh, indian scriptures translated under his guidance so he can choose what he wants to write how he wants to present who are the translators how things are to be interpreted and therefore this is a very crucial uh, position because he can actually influence the indian scholars indian masses by this work therefore we need to counter his idea of sanskrit is dead so we have five purpakshas here and the response in brief to them first one is sanskrit as a tool for hindutva political movement this is one of the thing which he says this is a quote from his book in the age of hindu identity politics hindutva inaugurated in the 1990s by the ascendancy of the indian people's party bharatiya janata party and its ideological auxiliary the world hindu council vishwa hindu parishad indian cultural and religious nationalism has been promulgating ever more distorted image of india as past few things are as central to this revisionism as sanskrit so this he is saying that this revival of sanskrit and promotion of sanskrit is actually there is a political agenda behind it so our response is that everything is politicized you cannot separate politics from life from language after all politics is also done through language and sanskrit is one of the language of india it is one of the recognized languages of india so you can't say that sanskrit has to be completely free from politics and if there are people who like sanskrit naturally they would like to promote it and I, what is wrong with that so some people prom- promote hindu hinduism some pr- people promote the language of hindu as hindi some are promoting urdu bengali punjabi if you go to south india they promote tamil or telugu or their own language so i don't see any specific reason to stress only sanskrit and make this claim sanskrit historical sphere of influence extends beyond hindu identity politics sanskrit is not just for hinduism but you know there are other religions also which are of course they came out from hinduism whether it is buddhism jainism sikhism their scriptures also some of them are written in sanskrit or they make reference to sanskrit works or even if they don't have original literature in sanskrit such as sikhism but it is based on sanskrit literature they also talk about rama and they talk about krishna they talk about many saints sages who are part of history of india so it is not that it sanskrit is just propaganda to promote hinduism then second purpaksha is that poor quality of sanskrit education so he says that with few exceptions however the sanskrit pedagogy and scholarship at these institutions have shown a precipitous decline from pre independence quality and standards almost in inverse proportion to the amount of funding they receive so this is one of the characteristic of pollock that he makes claims but does not give any data or basis of his claim he just makes a statement so like he says it is inversely proportion to the amount of funding they receive but there is no statistical evidence provided there are no sources referred and this term are very undefined 
it's just rhetorical and trying to influence the mind of people because he has a good position he is acclaimed as a great scholar of sanskrit so if he says something then it carries weight even if he is not supporting it with any proof so this kind of statement doesn't have much value unless you try to prove it or give some source or references so we don't value this then he says that poor performance in contemporary literature so sanskrit literature has fared no better this is one of his quote so we will we show that actually it is not true sanskrit has not fared worse than many other languages in india it has received sahitya academy awards about six of them it has also received the gyanpeeth award in 2006 which is one of the top awards in sanskrit so it cannot be said that it is poor unless you just want to you know make a case against it but there are many other languages which have done as good or as bad as sanskrit sanskrit may not be doing best among the indian languages originally there were 16 recognized languages now there are more but it is also not at the lowest rung of the languages then next thing he says is that there was a momentous rupture after 1550 to 1750 vibrant period and currently with the spread of european power however this dynamism diminished so much that by 1800 the capacity of sanskrit thought to make history had vanished this is quote from polak's book so we actually show from data which we have collected from carl h potter's encyclopedia of indian philosophy in the first volume he has given list of authors from century to century and he has also given the list of books which were written and here we have a chart and this chart is related to the authors unique sanskrit authors on the rise so if you see from 17th century to 18th century to 19th century to 20th century it's actually if you see the number of, of authors then the chart is very clear that it is going up and this chart does not show that sanskrit is dead actually there are more people writing now than in 17th century although the books if you see the number of books number of sanskrit works that is declined surely this chart shows that there is a decline but still in 20th century again you see that the curve is going up and we don't have the data for the 21st century but if that data is available probably it is continuing to go up so there is always periods you know in every everything even in companies even in business even in politics even one's own life there are ups and downs so we do agree that sanskrit did take a dip in the 18th century but it is again picking up and the reason we have not researched that and polak also doesn't give any reason why it happened but probably it is because britishers took over india in that period in the 18th century and they changed india's education system drastically from its traditional gurukula system to the western style so probably that is one of the reason that it took a dip otherwise even in the mughal period you know it was flourishing and again it is picking up now so this doesn't prove that sanskrit is dead or sanskrit is frozen in time as says or sanskrit is still born so then one of purupaksha which we make is polak's unsubstantiated vague terminology he is very good at this he his writing is very terse and difficult to understand and to actually overwhelm the reader thinking that he is a great scholar and therefore just believe what he is saying but if one pays attention to his writing then there is not much strength in it like he makes this statement most observers would agree that in some crucial way sanskrit is dead now this is a very vague statement because who are the observers in agreement to this 
are they the western scholars are they his followers his chelas who are they are they european scholars american scholars does it include the indian scholars so he doesn't say anything nor does he substantiate it by what does he mean by most observers so he makes the statement which is actually a false statement because most observers will not agree that sanskrit in some crucial ways dead because it is not dead so and then he does not define what is death of a language that is another interesting thing because what is the meaning of language is dead if he does not define it in our nyaya one thing which is very important is that you give a definition whenever you say something you define what it means you know if you say dravya if you say guna you know you have to give a definition of it but he doesn't give any definition and then it leaves for people to just speculate and because he is an authority in his field he has big clout around him he is awarded by president of india so when indian scholars may think wow he is saying it must be true but the data does not support this so he makes this vague terminology similarly government feeding tubes and oxygen tanks may try to preserve the language in a state of quasi animation but most observers would agree that in some crucial way sanskrit is dead so sanskrit is not in quasi animation state sanskrit is actually still functioning there are many scholars in india who still speak in sanskrit there are some at least some villages in south india there are villages in himachal pradesh where people actually speak in sanskrit in their day to day life and i give an example here of there is we have this forum of scholars bharatiya vidyut parishad and i got the figure from them that there are 1623 scholars who are actively engaged on it i'm i'm also one of them and regularly there is a talk on this forum about sanskrit literature about poetry about philosophy there are questions which are asked in sanskrit there are questions which are answered in sanskrit there are reference to the literature shlokas analysis of grammatical rules so this is not possible if a language is dead or frozen or still born then we know that there is a world sanskrit conference since 1972 and every 3 years they have you know world conference on this last one was 2015 there were 21 different sanskrit fields including pedagogy contemporary sanskrit writing poetics philosophy and so on so with all this the statement that sanskrit is dead does not hold ground then interestingly Pollux gave actually gives a definition of language vitality and this is very important to measure he says the communication of new imagination for example is hardly less valuable in itself than the communication of new information in fact a language capacity to function as a vehicle for such imagination is one crucial measure of its social energy so this is a very important statement which he makes and we agree with him and this actually defies his cl- very claim that sanskrit is dead because sanskrit is still vital in the sense even if there are no new literature coming out in sanskrit it is still a source of new imagination and so many ways people read they get ideas from sanskrit there are many scholars in india they are interpreting it new and new visions are coming from it we we will speak later on that there are rituals which are based on sanskrit there are pujas which are based how deities are installed and there are you know kathakars which are giving talks in based on sanskrit literature they give new interpretation to it so to say that sanskrit is not giving a vital you know energy to the society is wrong taking his own words so we have done a case study specifically to show because palak himself has done case study in his book he has four case studies done to prove that sanskrit is dead so to counter that i have done a case study of vraja i live in vrindavan in this whole area 84 square miles 
is called Vraja area. This is a place where Krishna lived 5200 years ago and especially in Vrindavan there are a lot of temples, ashrams but not only in Vrindavan, in Mathura, in Radhakund, in Govardhan and Barsana, Nandagav there are places where temples and ashrams and there is Sanskrit study going on there so I have made this case study and I am making this case study specifically to Gaudiya Vaishnavism that is the school of thought I am following and by that I want to show that Sanskrit is actually not dead at, at all I call it Sthali Pulak Nyaya those who are Sanskrit scholars they know it very well that when you cook rice you want to see whether rice is cooked or not you take one grain of it and then if that is cooked then the whole thing is cooked so I consider whole of India like a big pot because primarily it is country of Hindus whose literature are primarily in Sanskrit and their life, their rituals, their practices, their religion, everything is based on that. So if we can see that Sanskrit has lived in Brajaria, then from that we can see that it has also lived all over India in the same way because Vraja is a place which is very close to Delhi and as we will see it is a place which was attacked by Aurangzeb and all the temples were destroyed, people were actually not allowed even to put tilak or sacred thread upnen here they have to practically close everything and still it has survived so I say that this is actually a place where the grain is hardest grain and if the hardest grain is cooked then other grains must be cooked that's my logic so I do three things in my case study one is literary production other is the ritual use and third is the education so first literary production so 16th century new religion explosion of lively and imaginative activity initiated by various scholars poets and saints this is a quotation from David Haberman who is a great scholar from West I think he studied in Chicago probably a student of Demock Jr. I believe and the Vaishnava culture that began in Raja in the 16th century is still widely alive today this is not my statement but a quotation from him and the works of the creative leaders of the Vraja were then carried by others throughout northern India thus the lasting influence of the poetry text and religious culture that were produced so this is one quotation then there is another quote from SK Day he was a great scholar in the 20th century from Bengal and his works are very well honored one of the most remarkable feature of the Chaitanya movement is its extraordinary literary activity bold is mine the power and vitality of its inspiration being evidenced by the vast literature which is produced both in the learned classical tongue and in the living language of the province it enriched the field of Sanskrit scholarship by its more solid and laborious productions in theology, philosophy, ritualism and Ras Shastra so on the other it poured itself out lavishly in song and story almost creating as it did a new literary epoch so this is a very solid proof that Sanskrit was very much alive here in Braja and not only alive but actually it created a new school of thought all based on Sanskrit literature so no question of Sanskrit diminishing or dying here is another quote from a western scholar to this effect Tony Stewart they were scholars who had been deputed to gather and compose texts so they might better explain the religious devotion bhakti that Chaitanya had revealed so they here refers to the six Goswamis of Vrindavan Sanatan Goswami, Rupa Goswami, Jeev Goswami, Raghunath Das Goswami, Raghunath Bhatt Goswami and Gopal Bhatt Goswami all of them composed work in Sanskrit except Raghunath Bhatt Goswami and they wrote many many works and especially among them Jeev Goswami he was a very prolific writer he composed on every field he wrote plays, he wrote poetry, he wrote on philosophy he wrote commentaries on Bhagavatam he even wrote a Sanskrit grammar called Harinamamrit Vyakarnam 
especially for the Vaishnavas in which every sutra has got name of Krishna. And this grammar is still being taught in this area. In fact, I myself run a school of Harinamrita Vakaran here and at Radhakund we have two branches and there are about 50 students studying it. So, so much literature was produced and not only that it was just a repetition of things but novel ideas were brought out from the original texts such as Bhagavad Purana, Sanskrit as their literary medium, Bhagavad Purana, canonical text of new tradition, focal point of novel expositions. So newer and newer ideas were brought out from Bhagavad Purana especially showing that how Krishna is actually the source of all avatars is when Bhagwan speaking about bhakti as the fifth purushartha in India we know that traditionally there are four purushartha dharma artha kama and moksha but the Goswamis they propagated a fifth purushartha which they called as prema or preeti or love and this was all, all derived from literature such as Bhagavad Purana they also spoke of two types of bhakti Vedi bhakti which is based on following rules and regulations and bhakti which comes from the heart and then there are the scholars who wrote commentaries on the principal Upanishads a new way of interpreting the Upanishads Bhagavad Gita and Vedanta Sutra so, so much was written here and this was not only just in 16th, 17th century but it continued till 20th century, in fact, till today. We have scholar living at our place, he has commented on the Vedanta Sutra, on the Baldev Vidya Bhushan's commentary, he has written commentary. This is the latest edition, he has written a book called, Jiva Goswami's book called Saru Samvadani, he has written a commentary on that in Sanskrit. So works are still coming out. There recently, on Kishore Shastri, he wrote commentary on the whole Bhagavatam. So Sanskrit is very much alive, at least in Braja area. And here we have a quote from a very great scholar. Most people may have heard his name, Edward C. Dimock. Rupa and Sanatana and their nephew Jiva were brilliant men learned in the Shastras and every conceivable category of learning from aesthetics to grammar. Jiva was perhaps the most brilliant of all and he has more than 20 Sanskrit works covering grammar, poetry, poetics, ritual, theology and philosophy to his credit, including the monumental Satsandarvas, which is the first full treatment of the theology of Bengal school of Vaishnavism. So, this is to show them there. Other contemporaries along with the Goswamis like Prabodhananda Char, Saraswati, Narayan Bhatta, Narayan Bhatta wrote also maybe 30 books in Sanskrit and many other scholars, Krishna Das Kaviraj, he was just contemporary and then Vishnath Chakurti came later on in 17th century, Baldevudya Bhushan, late 17th century, beginning of 18th century, so they all composed. So he is another quote, Tarapad Mukhopadhyaya. He says that the real Chaitanya Charitamrita was the Sanskrit skeleton that was fleshed out by the Bengali text. Although Krishna Das Kaviraj wrote one work in Sanskrit called Govind Lilamrit, it is a Mahakavya. But he also wrote Chaitanya Charitamrita, which is very popular, just like the Ramcharit Manas of Tulsi Das. But uh, although this is in Bengali, but uh, it has got 3000 quotes from Sanskrit embraced by nearly 20,000 verses of Bengali. This is statement of Tony Stewart. So massive production was done. Then we have 20th century Kedarnath Datta Bhaktivinod. Yeah, he is in 19th century. And he wrote more than 100 books in Sanskrit, Bengali and English. And some were of course commentaries but 20 original works he wrote Krishna Samhita, Sri Gorang, Leela Smaran Stotra, these are Sanskrit works. Then this tradition continues. We have 20th century examples of Sri Haridas Das of Navdvip. We have Gaudiya Mat, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. He democratized Sanskrit 
anybody can read not that it is just a you know property of some few scholars then we had puridas goswami krishna das baba of kusum sarovar my own gurudev sri haridas shastri he printed more than 100 books most of them in sanskrit he commented them he was teaching the works hundreds of students studied under him i was one of them so there are new sanskrit commentaries i mentioned this already pandit anand gopal das he is our one of the teachers giriraj kishore shastri made already mention of this so now we this is one of the uh, three categories of the case study so this to show that gaudiya vaishnavism is based on sanskrit literature and it has continued writing works in sanskrit although not so much is being produced but the original works are still being studied and newer and newer meanings are coming out of that which is a type of new imagination as polak says that is also as good as writing new works and then the second category is the contemporary sanskrit education so there are three types of institutions for this there are government institutions specifically universities there is a ban maharaj college here in vrindavan there is colleges in mathura so sanskrit is one of the subjects being taught there then there are private institutions and i have done a survey there are at least 30 plus sanskrit schools in raj area which is vrindavan radhakund govardhan barsana nandgaon gajipur etc i also run a private institute where i teach sanskrit and sanskrit literature in fact at present i am giving a 6 month course where more than 50 students have come from all over the world they are staying here and learning subjects such as nyaya yoga sutra bhagavad gita vedanta sutra and so on and then there is another way of teaching which is which goes unnoticed most of the time that is a traditional guru shishya relationship there are hundreds of ashrams in vrindavan and most heads of the ashrams they are scholars they teach to their students their disciples so this way the sanskrit remains alive and then the another vitality of sanskrit is through rituals so sanskrit plays an indispensable role in ritual performance it is catalyst of cultural animation novel production of social images and samskaras all the hindu samskaras they are done through sanskrit mantra chanting of mantras stotra prayers in the temples deity installation deity worship all this makes use of sanskrit language and in you know, the pandas pujaris they may not be great sanskrit scholars but they have some knowledge of that so here i read one quote from tony stewart he says each generation was charged with the responsibility of revalorizing its tradition without destroying it to make it relevant to a contemporary world without having to diverge from the general consensus of its broad normative ideas so there are always newer and newer ideas nuances which come out from the old works of the great acharyas and then we have the pandas who take the who are like the spiritual guides in the holy place then there are bhagavat kathakars this is very one very popular way of speaking and there are seven days programs given by speakers and although they speak in hindi but they all the time quote from sanskrit they have to know sanskrit and many of the people in the audience they also know so this is the another way of sanskrit being a vital source for social life or spiritual religious life here in raj area so this is my conclusion that significant doubt cast on polak's provocative argument an outcome of raja case is that novel literary contribution sanskrit historical vibrancy small part in larger tapestry of sanskrit's rich and variegated intellectual history so same probably can be done studies with other sampradayas like vallabha sampradaya so much literature produced in their sampradaya nimbark sampradaya and then you go to south india we have madhva sampradaya we have sankar sampradaya we have shri sampradaya then we have kashmir shavism and the other branches of shavism 
and then tantras which are also all originally literal in sanskrit and there are so many people who are still following them and studying and you know putting them in their life so to say that sanskrit is dead i think it is a very tall claim and does not hold ground thank you To help me, you can do two things. You can go to the subscribe button on my YouTube and subscribe. We need more subscribers there. Uh, secondly, I get lots of emails on people saying, how do we donate? How can we help you? Uh, you go to rajimalhotra.com or you go to infinityfoundation.com and you can hit the donate button. You can donate in dollars. There are different ways mentioned. If you want to donate in rupees, there is a column called uh, Infinity Foundation India and you click that and there are instructions on how you can donate in India.